Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final part of our four-part series, Practical Kashrut, organized, hosted by Mizrahi, together with Kosher Australia. Um, to introduce Rabbi Shrek, who's going to speak to us tonight on a very practical and interesting topic, I'll tell you that yesterday afternoon, I popped into a certain restaurant, and there the lady in the restaurant was telling me how wonderful her rabbi is. I said, okay, good to know, which shul do you go to? She said, no, no, it's not my shul rabbi, it's the rabbi who comes in and checks the restaurant. And that's the rabbi who's going to be speaking to us this evening. And I think it's an incredible achievement because when you're a kashrut inspector in a restaurant, you're a policeman. You have to come in and maintain high standards and demand many things of the owners. And at the same time, if the lady who owns the restaurant is able to say how much she loves her rabbi, that we're able to maintain high standards, but to do so with a smile in a way which is well received is a wonderful reflection on Rabbi Shrek. It's a wonderful reflection on everything that Kosher Australia does. It's great to have you with us this evening and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Rabbi Burbis, for that introduction. I'll tell you the secret is that we give all the restaurants a, uh, a break from their, what they have to pay if they give a positive report about us. So that's why it always works. I'm just kidding. Um, so thank you very much, Rabbi Burbis, for organizing the other organizers involved. Um, I personally find it a, a schuss. It's a, an honor for me to be on the same ballot, on the same uh, roster as Rav Ramon. For me, that's a big schuss. And um, at Kosher Australia, we, besides certifying products and industrial and food services and the shrita, we also view it as our obligation, as part of what we do, to educate the kosher consumer about different various topics and kashras. So this is kind of what we're here for. It's not an added you know, uh, you know, bonus. This is actually what part of what we do. <clears throat> the topic I would like to discuss tonight is bug checking, infestation in halacha. Now, when it comes to, there'll be three parts to the shear. First, I'll give some background about, about um, the approach to insects in halacha. And then we'll discuss six halachic concepts that are essential, three that are really essential, other three others that are nice, are nice side ideas um, relating to, to infestation, to checking for bugs. And then the main thrust of the shear is actually going to be a hands-on practical guide of how to check, I brought some of my props, how to check vegetables and herbs. And that's the main point of the shear is that hands-on practical, practical um, side of things. When it comes to any halacha, any, um, any rav, any, any posig will say that in order to rule in a, an efficient, in a competent manner, so the rav has to know the halacha, very important to know the halacha. Also, the rav has to know the, what's called the mitzis. He has to know the, the reality. I just got a shayla this past week, nothing to do with kashras, about a, sh a certain shaver. Is this shaver acceptable? So one can know what it says in Shulchan Aruch, backwards and forwards, what all the places can say. But if one doesn't know how the shaver works, so that knowledge in Shulchan Aruch is not going to get you that far. It's the same thing when it comes to kashras. Um, the, last week I was uh, I visited with Rabbi Baskin, who spoke last week, I think, here. Um, a spray drive, see how we kasher a spray drive. Now, if you can learn Shulchan Aruch backwards and forwards with all the noisy kalim, with all the poskin, and until you come face to face with a spray dryer, one's not going to know how to, how to kasher. A spray dryer is, it's an unbelievable thing. I would say the majority of food items that we consume, processed, industrial, have ingredients that were processed in a spray dryer. A spray dryer is, Mrs. Melman probably can describe it much better than I can, a spray dryer is this massive, it could be three, four stories, two stories tall, where they, they um, spray a product, let's say a milk, you want to make milk powder. So you spray it in a mist, it comes into this massive, tremendous machine, and this a gust of hot air comes, and it meets this mist, and it dehydrates it, and the, it turns into a powder, and it gets stuck on the walls, or falls down to the bottom. So it's very complicated how to kasher that. Now, a person can know the halach is backwards and forwards, but unless he knows exactly how the spray dryer works, so he's going to be at a loss as far as how to competently uh, rule on this issue. So infestation is the same thing. We're going to first, like I said, give a little intro into the, the stringency of the halacha, then give the basic halachic principles, that's step one, and then step two is to educate what do we look for, what do the bugs look like, how do we check, and then hopefully we'll be able to, Be'ezra Hashem, be able to, um, to, to guard ourselves, to save ourselves from this very st uh, strict prohibition. <clears throat> okay, let's say, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom, let's say 
one of us found out that what we had for supper last night or tonight was pig. They made a mistake. The butcher was a, trim, a horrible mix-up in the, in the Shechita house. And uh, they thought it was meat. And, yeah, and we found out, chas v'shalom, that we ate pig. So some of us might throw up, so disgusted by it. Everyone will feel horrible, will feel, you know, very bad, very down. Someone's told me, actually, they're at a Shabbos table. And um, they were serving the chicken soup. And this person noticed that the, the, the matzo balls taste quite interesting. It's a nice, you know, different taste. Next thing you know, there's a shriek from the kitchen. Ah, there's a shriek. That by accident, she put the cheese balls in the chicken soup. So you can imagine the cheese balls. You can imagine that uh, everyone was very upset. We have to realize that when it comes to vegetables and herbs, and sometimes fruit, the same things can, can apply. Um, there are three types of bugs that we might find in vegetables, and herbs, and fruit. Um, we have what's called the sharetz hamayim. A sharetz hamayim are water insects. For eating one sharetz hamayim, one small, as long as the naked eye can perceive it, if one eats one sharetz hamayim, that's four prohibitions. Pig, if, you, if one eats a kazayas, an olive size of pig, that's the, the full-fledged biblical prohibition. When it comes to these shrubs and these insects, for the smallest sherets, the smallest bug that's, that you can see with your naked eye, there's four laven if it's a water insect, five laven, five transgressions for each small insect if it's a land insect, and six if it flies. For the flies to fly around and get to fall into the salad, so that could be six prohibitions. Um, so I'll just share with you one of the most infested um, vegetables and herbs that we deal with is kale, K-A-L-E, it's the latest superfood. Um, and, you know, I've, I've checked it many times, and it's in the summer, as we get into this year, we'll see more details about this, but um, in the summer especially, I once found probably more than 30 bugs, 30 aphids, in, in one head of kale. So if we'll consider that a land insect, so that's 30 times 5. So it's 150 prohibitions. If one eats a head of kale, that's 150 prohibitions. That's like a whole side of pig. So it's a very, very stringent, very, very stringent um, prohibition. Um, the question is, uh, why? Why is the Torah so stringent when it comes to insects, when it comes to not unslaughtered meat, when it comes to eating food that wasn't tithed from Eretz Yisrael? We don't find such, such a stringency. So why is it that by insects in particular we find these stringencies? So the pre Chodosh, who's one of the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, he actually lived only 29 years. He was 29 years old when he passed away, and he wrote chidush and novella on Shulchan Aruch that are just essential to anyone who's learning um, those topics that he wrote about. And he writes, in, in the sim that deals with insects, that since it's so matzo, it's so common that we have insects, it's in almost all the foods we eat. And unless one is meticulous in making sure they're not there, the Torah puts such a stringency on this transgression, on this issue, so we're very careful and meticulous to make sure that we take it with the proper, proper seriousness. That's, uh, that's the background. And the Gemara actually says in Bab Mitzia, very interesting, it says that there's one, we'll call it mitzvah, that if Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim just to fulfill this one mitzvah, it's worth the whole thing. The whole Yitzias Mitzrayim leaving of Egypt was worth it. The Jewish people should keep this one mitzvah. What mitzvah is that? Not to be metamed, to purify themselves with shrubs and with insects. So the Gemara says, I don't understand. There are transgressions that are much more stringent than, eating, than, than not eating bugs. There are other more, worse. There's murders, there's other things. So the Gemara says, that's correct. There are prohibitions that are worse, but there's something that's ma'us, something that's loathful, that's, we'll say, disgusting, for lack of a better word, when it comes to eating these bugs. And that's something Hashem wants us to stay very far away from. It's not so much the, the stringency of the halacha, but it's more what it says about a person, and there's a certain loathsomeness that a Jew has when he consumes these creatures, and that is why um, it's a very stringent uh, prohibition. Okay, that was part one. Any questions? Okay. Part two is six halachic concepts that we'll need to understand and to, to appropriately apply these halachas. The first three are crucial, and they are as follows. The question is, when am I obligated to check for bugs? When? I have to check everything? Corn on the cob? I, can I eat a carrot without checking for insects? When do I have to be concerned? So there are three halachic categories. We'll start with the most lenient. It's called a miut she'enoi motzu. 
which means it's a minority, and I'll call it an uncommon minority. Most posts can say 10%. If infestation levels are less than 10%, that's called an uncommon minority. I need not check that produce. So we can safely say in a carrot, in a healthy looking piece of fruit, where there's no spoilage, a good apple and orange, we can safely say that the chances of finding a bug are way less than 10%. So any food item with its less than 10% chance of finding a bug, you do not have to check. The halach says, in the first instance, one may consume this food. As an assad, yes? Can the infestation percentage change from year or standard? Excellent question, yes. That's what makes, and you'll see as we go on in the shear, that it's the most frustrating part of this area of halacha is that it's a constant change. Um, different areas, I'll just throw one example, one famous example is strawberries. Um, coming from Israel, from America, anywhere, really, uh, anywhere else in the world, when it comes to strawberries, they're highly infested. In Australia, Baruch Hashem, we can say with confidence, it's a miut she'eno matzu, which means it's less than 10%. You have to cut off the, the top, the green part on top. But in the strawberry itself, in Australia, less than 10%. So one need not, in the first instance, check strawberries. It's a nice idea. Again, the Gemara says in, in Bamitzia, that's one of the reasons why we came out of Mitzrayim. It's a nice idea for someone who wants to, but if you end up in a kiddush or you're at someone's house or it's last minute shops, you can get a chance to. Or if you just don't have the time, it's okay to consume, to consume strawberries without checking in advance. It's a miut she'enu matzui. Um, but th things do change. Strawberries happen to always stay below the 10% mark. But um, for example, we'll get to later on, kale and asparagus. Right? So I found them to be very infested, but in different times of the year, not infested. So it really depends if it's a drought, if it's very rainy. Um, the, the temperature for sure, different climates, different areas. We'll get to all that, but it's a great question. So that's the first concept. The miyuch eno motsui, an uncommon minority, one does not have to check. Concept number two, yes. It's funny you said that about strawberries, because in South Africa they are infested and you have to check. Them. That's right. So it depends on which country. For sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so like we said, you know, we, one can know the halachas, we can know this concept, it's a very simple concept, but. To apply it, one has to know the reality. So in South Africa, I know in Eretz Yisrael, infested. Yeah. You know, but here, Australia is blessed that in this regard, that um, really it's a, very, it's a non buggy climate and country. So um, a lot of things you can do here, you can't do in other places. Whenever we have company from overseas, so my wife always buys strawberries, these things that you can never get anywhere else. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a luxury to have it over here. Um, Okay, that's the first concept. The miyut she'en matzui, less than 10%. Number two, a miyut ha-matzui, which means it's a common minority. That means it's from 10% through 49%. Majority of the time, I do not find insects. No insects to be found, the majority of the time. Therefore, from a biblical standpoint, I don't have to check. But the rabbi said, let's check for anything above 10%. That's one of the reasons why there are many different things that invalidate an animal, trephus, different um, diseases or um, things that could go wrong with the, with the anatomy of the animal that can render it a trefa. We only check for one thing, and that's the lungs, because that's the miyut Finding a trefa, an issue with the lung of an animal happens 10% of the time, we check the lungs. We don't check to make sure that the skull wasn't punctured. We don't check to make sure that uh, there's no hole in the liver. Because those things are miyut she'en matzui. This applies to all areas of Allah. We need not be concerned for less than 10%. Once we hit 10%, midir rabbinically, we have to be concerned. Maybe this infestation, we must check. But that's only in the first instance. Let's say I bought something, Brussels sprouts. We'll see, is a miyut ha matzui. Brussels sprouts, there is, especially in coals. It's interesting, because coals, usually, the higher end places, so there's, it's a better quality, and there's much less infestation. But Cole's Brussels sprouts, for some reason, I'm finding 30 to 40 percent are, are infested, have bugs in them. So, a, so a Brussels sprout, a person should check it in the first instance. But let's say you forgot and went into the soup, and now you can't check it. If it's only a common minority, that's fine. Now you can eat the soup lechatchila. One should check in the first instance. If one didn't, and now you can't, so you can eat it. That's the second concept. Miut hamatsu. And the third is called muhzak bitolaim, which means that it's 50% or more. It's majority, really, infested. So, like we said before, kale in the summer months for sure, 
local asparagus is, is like that. Um, the, the research we did years ago showed that uh, dill also is muchzak bitoloim, it's a, it's a majority. Those are things that one has to check biblically, and if one doesn't, they, and they fall into the soup, they get mixed in, you have to throw it out, you have to check. So these three concepts are crucial. Miyut she'eno matsui, uncommon minority less than 10%, between 10 and 49, and 50 and above. Less than 10. Mutter, in the middle, midar abanan, one must check, and the, the muhzak betoloim, you have to check midar raisa. Those are the three concepts. Can you say that slowly the last topic? Muhzak betoloim. Yeah, so it's a muhzak, which means it's, um, it's assumed to have... Uh, the status quo is we assume it has bugs. Those are the three concepts. Any questions on those? Okay. Um, so those are, the, those are the main concepts. Now, one might be wondering what happened to nullification. We all know that if a forbidden substance falls into a permitted substance, in some instances, if I have a majority of permitted substance, I can consume the, the mixture. Most things we need 60 times. It's 1.6%. If it's less than that, it's nullified. If I have 60 times the permitted substance against the prohibited substance, then it is mutter. Why by bugs is there no bittel? Why is there no nullification? And the answer is because a barrier, it's called a barrier means a complete creature has no nullification. It's a rabbinic stringency that if the bug is broken up into pieces, as we'll see that that middle category of miyutamatsu, we said one thing is that if I forgot to check and I got mixed into the soup already, I don't have to check. The second leniency we have with that middle category is, let's say you want to puree your Brussels sprouts into a soup, or whatever it might be. You can do that, because the problem here is I have a whole bug. I'm concerned for a barrier, for a whole bug in the Brussels sprouts. But if I puree it, so I can be for sure, I, it's definite that it got broken up into pieces. Now I'm pureeing it not for the purpose of destroying the bug. I want to puree this, uh, this food item. So I'm doing, I'm doing it for that reason. It's not, my, it's not my intention. It might not be there. It's permitted. Yes? Is that um, only for those um, items that we think wouldn't have the majority? Yes. Yeah, if it's muhzak betaloim, if it's that, it's the asparagus and the kale, so one cannot do that. It's only if it's a miyuta, that middle category. So Assuming it's a muhzak, yes, yes, yes. Whatever's in that third category, even if you ground, grind it up, you cannot use it. The person who grounds it up can't use it. Maybe other people, this different, uh, depends if it was maize or shogig, not getting into that, but one should ask a shayla. If one ground up asparagus or kale, one should ask a shayla as to who can, can consume that. Um, but whatever's in that middle category, you can, yes. What, the checking? No, the, the pureeing? Whenever you want, it's fine. The, the bug is not going to prohibit your, your dish, your, your pot. For a different, it's also complicated how lucky the reason why that is. But. What about tins or bottles and asparagus? That's also a problem. And that you can't check. It's too hard to check. It's a moist. Yeah. So spinach is, is uh, a mute and a muscle. Yeah. Yes, you can. And as an aside, it's a good point, a good reason thing that you mentioned that. When it comes to the, let's say, bag, I get this question all the time, the bagged lettuce and coals and the frozen stuff, bird's eye, all these, all these companies. So the industrial cleaning that the vegetables and herbs go through and the fruit is we cannot come close to our little uh, mixing bowls here and, and with the holding up to the light. They have such a good with a caustic in that you can assume, unless it's muhzak, unless it's asparagus and kale, you can assume that all that is, has been cleaned properly and may be consumed. Yes, yes. You'll be happy to hear that cauliflower, cauliflower and broccoli also are miyutsh and matzu. I check every week a number of things for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 weeks. And I have found, I think once in 30 weeks, I found a, a worm in broccoli. You don't have to check. We always recommend washing it under the tap, just rinse it off, just to be safe. But once you rinse it off under the tap, then for sure it's a miyuch and a matsui, combined with their industrial wash, combined with the fact that many of these things anyway are miyuch and a matsui, you rinse it under the tap and you can eat without doing anything further. That's correct. 
So kel, we're more hesitant with because that is a muhzak bitoloim. Once something gets the status of a muhzak bitoloim, it's much harder to get out of that status. So, so Right, so, well, you yourself can do your own, you know, research by wherever you buy from, so check. We send out emails, um, I can put you on the list, we send out emails every so often, updates as to when things change. Um, but in general, things don't change that often, but we, we do try to notify the, the, the tzibur, the, the kehillah, uh, when things change. Okay, so that's, that's nullification is our fourth concept, the concept of a barrier that um, there's no, um, there is no nullification when it comes to, when it comes to that. Um, okay, so that's, that's actually four and five, that's nullification and barrier. Another interesting halach, which I'll just throw out for, just for a moment, but it's not so practical, and that is there's a concept that these bugs are only prohibited when they come out of the place where they grew. The Gemara Nchulun, Gemara Nchulun says that if, um, if it... If it, was, if it became perceivable to the eye, which means obviously it comes from somewhere else, but if it grew inside the fruit, so you have an apple that's, that's a, a, fine, it's a good apple, it's totally closed, and you eat it, you bite into a worm, chas so it's not necessarily prohibited, because that worm never left its place where it grew. I don't know if you remember, there was a few years back, there was this big um, controversy with the Anasaki worm in fish. There's a whole big to-do. Um, so that, that was the whole controversy surrounded this, this issue of where did these bugs grow? If they grew in the flesh of the fish and they stayed there, you can eat them. As, much, as unsavory as that sounds, halachically you can eat them. If they migrated to the stomach, then there was an issue. That was the issue there. So as a side point, if the bug is inside the fruit and never left the fruit, then it's permitted. But that's not going to be such a common occurrence. The main thing to take away from this part two is the three concepts. Less than 10%, you don't have to check. 10 to 49, Midirabana, you have to check. But if you didn't check and it's too late, you're fine. And if you want to puree it because you want to puree it, that's also fine. And then we have Muchzak Bitoloim, that's the most stringent, and that's Midiraisan. Even after the fact, it's a problem. That is, this, that is the halachic side of things. And now we'll get to some demonstrations unless we have any questions. Okay. So I brought here, we'll start with my favorite. Start with kale. Now there are we have a number of, of basic ways that we check. When it comes to leafy greens, make sure I have my notes over here. When it comes to leafy greens, okay. We have the following steps. Um, we should you should wash the produce well. We always recommend washing it well beforehand. Take your here we have kale. Now in I've given this year a number of times. And I started off, I was very excited because the first time I did it was in the summer. And in every specimen that I brought, I found bugs. And it was great. But then the next two times were quite humbling. I didn't find bugs. And they were both in the winter. So I suspect that maybe kale has changed its status because of the seasons. But normally you take the kale and you see the contours of the kale. It's just, uh, you know, bugs can really get in there and very hard to get it out. So you put it under a nice stream of water. Um, and then we place it into a, bowl, a stainless steel bowl. Um, hopefully you have better lighting than we have here. And you put it into the water. Now Rabbi Gutnik, our Rav Hamachshir, says that you do not need to add soap or salt. Uh, many other hashgachos will recommend putting some salt. The OU, the Star K, do recommend putting in soap. Rabbi Gutnik feels there's no really conclusive evidence that that does anything. They, I think they say that it kind of um, it, it makes them slip off the, the, the leaves easier. But Rabbi Gutnik holds that's not the case. So you put it into water, you wash it off. Step one. Step two, you put it into water, let it sit for like maybe 15 seconds, a half a minute, make sure it's submerged. And then you just go like this. You play around with it, move it around, move the contours between your fingers. And we're trying to dislodge any bugs that might be there. That's the idea. And then you pick it up, try to shake out all excess water over the bowl without ruining the item that. And then, so there's a number of methods you can do. If you have good lighting, so you can um, you know, put this up to a, good, a lamp maybe or to the window from the outside during the daytime and inspect the water and see if we find bugs. And I've learned to get very close to water and not to be afraid. 
And imagine what the people in the restaurants think when they see me. They see, you know, I got the beard is going like this to the, you know, the, that's what you have to do, okay, no, no choice. So you're looking for, in the water here for bugs. And my luck, there's no bugs. Huh? Forgot to bring my spoon. What's this? No, it's not a bug. Um, we're looking actually, ah, I forgot to hand out. Let me hand out first. Before we go through what we have to check, you have to know what you're looking for, right? So what I usually find, what I have found in kale is the following. Okay, let's uh, just pass these around. Okay. I don't think I made enough for everyone, but let's just pass these around. Thank you. So if you look on the, um, the page without the citrus fruits, so one thing we're looking for are thrips. Those are the small skinny guys found in leafy vegetables, cabbage, cauliflower, scallion. Um, then we have aphids. What I found in kale, what we're looking for is aphids. Now the aphids in this picture are, Baruch Hashem, very healthy. Um, you'll find in the, in the vegetables and in the, in, the, in the herbs, they could be dead and they'll turn a little bit brown. But that, it's that shape. Like what I just found now, I knew just by looking at it that it's not, even though it's black, I knew it wasn't a bug. Because I know what the bugs look like in kale. Once one gets experience with what to look for, I'm looking for that type of like oval, oblong-shaped body. Um, those, those aphids are found in um, a lot in kale and other leafy vegetables. Um, then leaf miners, scallion, celery, which is misspelled, I know, parsley and dill. Turn over the page. The leaf miners are these little bugs. That you can't really, it's hard to see them, but they leave a trail. So you have this, um, it's, it's not a straight line. It's very squiggly. That's how you know it's a leaf miner. You can find that in scallions, um, in celery, those type of, of food items. And the other one, which is many people are unaware of, is our scale insects that we find in citrus fruits, sometimes in apricots. We'll have some examples we'll show. These are bugs. If you actually Google it, you can find some wonderful little clips about um, how they form in there. And it's quite repulsive when you realize what it is. Um, but it's these black dots that you'll see on the top and the surface of oranges and lemons and other such fruit. And the way you know if it's dirt or if it's a, um, a scale insect is try to pick it off with your finger. If it comes right off, so it could be just a piece of dirt. If you pick a little bit and it comes off, that is a scale insect. If it doesn't come off unless you take out from the fruit itself, that's just uh, something on the fruit. That's not a scale insect. So it's these, I have a few specimens here that have scale insects on them. Um, it's these black little dots. Now, you're eating the orange, you're not eating the peel. One has to just be careful that as you're peeling, so the insects might get on your fingers, and if you touch the fruit, they go back onto the fruit. They're on the peel, so you're not eating the peel. Unless you're making rinds, but you're not eating the peel. So one just has to be careful to make sure that his hands don't get dirty with the scale insects, and he puts it back onto the, um, onto the food item. So what, what I'm looking for in kale and in, um, in um, cost lettuce really are the, those aphids. So I'm just going to try one more time. Again, I'd go to the tap, I would rinse it off, and then actually what I would do is I would fill this basin of water with the produce inside and have the water, as the water is filling up, a good um, strong stream of water, I'd have that go over all the different contours of the, of the item. And let's we'll see if we get lucky this time. Let it soak for around 15, 30 seconds and then agitate it in the water. Squeeze it out. Let's see if we get lucky now. Can you give a look? And I don't think so. There might be one there. No, it's not. Okay, so we didn't find this time. But that's the basic procedure. That's what we would do for all um, different items. The leafy vegetables. I have here this I mentioned before. The Coals especially, cost lettuce. I have found, since Pesach, since after Pesach, a very high rate of infestation. So I'm just going to try that now. Now, we should know that in general, the outer layers can have just bugs and flies just not really infested from the inside, just as things travel, uh, you know, things, bugs can fly in there. But uh, so anyway, usually people take off the outer layers. And then, again, the same process under the, under the sink, into the water. Cut it again like this. Move your fingers over the contours, try to any bugs that are there we're trying to dislodge. Like that. Again, we'd be changing the water every single time, obviously, it gets quite murky. You do it again and again. And you know, so again, let it sit for 30 seconds, agitate, 
Squeeze out any excess water. You don't have to totally get rid of all the water. Squeeze out any, any excess water. Put it to the side. And then you check the water to see what you find. Usually, usually the bugs float. Um, this one looks to be clean. OK. Yeah, this looks to be clean. OK, but th that's the way we check those type of vegetables. Under the tap, fill it up in, with water, let it soak, agitate it, shake it out over, and check the water. You can also visually inspect. Sometimes I'll hold it up to a good light like this, and the, the light penetrates right through the, the, the lettuce. And you look for any black dots or any you know, dark areas. That's also a way to do that. Those are the two methods. You can check each leaf if you want, or you can do this method as well. Yes? Oh, that's a good answer. But if you've done the watering method, then you wouldn't need to. You wouldn't need to. Kosher, we believe that it's sufficient to do the water method, as does the OU and the star K. Um, but if one wants to, they can check visually whatever whatever is easier for you. Yeah. Do you have to do more water? No, you could do it one at a time. It's just this way is just easier. Like, for example, we go into restaurants and there's a time constraint. So we're not being lenient because we're in a rush, but since this is a, a viable method, it's, a, it's, it's a, a valid method to check for infestation, you can put it, just, it makes it easier. Put everything in at once. But of course, you can do one at a time also. Yes? Excellent question. Okay, it's a good point. If you find. Let's say you find a bug. I have my cost lettuce, and I did this method of the washing method, and I checked the water, and I found a bug. I then have to empty out the water and check it again. Do the same, repeat the same steps. If that happens a second time, then do it again. If it's clean, then you're fine. If after a third time, I f I'm still finding bugs after a third washing, now this particular batch is muhzak bitoloi. This particular batch now is, I'm finding three times, that's a chazaka, what's called in halacha, and therefore I can only consume it if I check three more times and don't find bugs. Our policy in restaurants is once we find three times, we chuck it out, because the mashkiach can't stand there and check something seven, eight times. Um, but that's one method in checking, but then you can still check leaf by leaf. If you check three times and you found bugs, that means somewhere in this batch, you, you, we assume there are more bugs there. Now, if I take each leaf and I put it up to the light and I don't see a bug in there, so it's not on this leaf, so I can eat it. So that's, that would be an option. But if you took the batch and washed it, so if you got three clear washings, then you would fill it at nine, because then Yes, yes. As long as you want to still as vigilant as they were in the beginning and the meticulous in how they're checking, for sure. It gets, after a while, it gets tiresome. But yeah, definitely. Yes. I would say um, the first few times, it's a good question. I would say the first few times just to give a close look to make sure, but um, it, it depends what kind of, like Brussels sprouts are these black little guys. So it really depends on the item. Um, in kale, I would probably tell you not to pay attention so much to it, but the best is the first few times check, and then after a while you'll see yourself, you get to, you'll gain the confidence with experience what things are dirt, what things are bugs, but in the beginning, it's always careful. You know, it's better to err on the side of caution. But in general, in kale, um, in uh, no, Brussels sprouts, not, but in kale, I those black dots are just dirt. Um, but like I said, in Brussels sprouts, in, in, in coarse lettuce, that could be bugs. It really depends on the, on the item. So that's machlokas. We are stringent. If we see, I mean, like we said before, right, it's only prohibited if I can see the bug. Right? There are microscopic bugs everywhere. So we can't eat anything. The answer is that whatever we can't see with the naked eye, the halacha says does not exist. As far as the halacha is concerned, that's fine. We're not concerned for microscopic bugs. Let's say I see a black dot, but I can't tell it's a bug. Upon further investigation with my magnifying glass, I see it's a bug. That's the machlokas. One has to ask the rav how they should, in such a case, how the, we are machmir in kosher Australia, and we, if we see something that's suspicious, we'll investigate further to see if it has legs, if it looks like a bug, and if yes, then we will, uh, we will discard that. But there's different opinions when it comes to that. Sure. You used the same with your bulb, where you could see the light colors in here. If you use a glass bulb or a white bulb, can it be worse? Or is it still using yes. the same 
you should definitely use a stainless steel. The other option is to use a glass bowl on, and place it on a light box. Gold's Judaic now bought these, they now sell these light boxes. It's a little, you know, a box like this, like a cutting board, and has a very good light underneath it. So it just, you don't need it, it's not essential from a halachic perspective, but it makes checking easier. So I could take a Pyrex, a glass bowl, put it on top of that light box, and the light shines right through, it's easier than seeing it in a stainless steel bowl. But the stainless steel bowl reflects the light very well, and you can see the different, the different insects that might be there. Yes? If you've got your leather street cut on Shabbos, and you haven't checked it, you have to check on Shabbos? Yes, you can check on Shabbos. If you find the bug, you can't take it off, that, that would be a Shabbos, but you can check. This cr that criterion of whether you can see it or not does, it depends on whether you have normal vision, doesn't it? Uh, so it, the, um, the basic barometer is going to be the, the average person. So if I have poor vision, you know, I can't take off my glasses, I don't see anything. You know, you can't, uh, one can't do that. But um, if it's, you know, the, the average vision, if the average person can see it, so then that would be, that'd be a problem, even if I personally can't see it. Yes? So some, some say salt helps, others argue that salt causes the bug, causes the bug to grip onto the leaf in its last moments, and it gets stuck on the leaf. That's what, that's what some say. Um, again, Rabbi Gudnick does not know if any of this really is, has been proven or not. You know, he's a little bit you know, skeptical about it, but... Um, so, yeah, yeah, you could, you could. Again, we hold it's unnecessary to do that, but, um, you know, it's... it's uh, I don't think Rabbi Gudnick holds that it's going to hurt if you do that. Anything else? Any other questions? On Shabbos. Yes. You have to put lid in, in a bowl. And, and how do you separate whether you... So on Shabbos, I'd recommend just holding it up to the light. And um, if you see a bug, so you have to be careful exactly. It's different, you know, the halach of borer is going to be uh, relevant. And if you take some of the leaf with the bug, you know, you can't just pull the bug off the leaf. Maybe you can. Maybe it's not a tarubis. One has to ask the rav exactly how to deal with it, but definitely be permitted to take a little bit of lettuce with the bug off. And if there's no bugs, obviously, then it's not a problem. Yes? If I find in this bowl right now, oh, if I find the... It's not foolproof, yeah, it's not, it's not foolproof, but it's enough that if, we don't, if you don't find a bug in the water, then we, it's a mere chain of mozzi. I mean, the chances that a bug is, I, I didn't do the full, uh, the full, the real deal here. I'm just a demonstration, but I would take a very strong stream of water and, you know, massage, so to speak, the contours of the, the, the folds of the, of the item and agitate it pretty significantly and let it soak in there, and then I check the water. If no bugs are found, even, even if the item, let's say, is a mir hamatsui, or is it a muhsak betoloim? If no bugs are found after that, then I can assume it's a miut she'en matzu. That's how it works. There still might be a bug there, but after that rigorous cleaning and check, still there's no bug, it's a miut she'en matzu. Worst case. And therefore I can consume it. That's what, uh, that's what we assume. Okay, that's with the, the leafy vegetables. Okay, broccoli and cauliflower. Do I have that here? I might not. No, I don't think so. Okay. Broccoli and cauliflower, I'll just explain. Um, what one does is they take the broccoli or the cauliflower, they cut it into pieces, this, this big, a little bigger, and okay, here's the issue. With broccoli, cauliflower is easy because caulif cauliflower is white, and the bugs are green or black or brown. When it comes to broccoli, so the bugs often are green. Therefore, they're camouflaged into the, camouflaged into the broccoli. So what do you do? So the OU recommends, it's a great etza, a great I, a piece of advice that I found helps for me, works for me, and that is you put it into the microwave for a minute or a minute and a half, or I'll just take water from a kettle and pour it, put it into this, in this bowl here, put the broccoli in there, pour hot water, let it sit there for a minute or two, and the broccoli gets soft. Then I'm able to look through the florets. I'm looking at what does this boiling do? It makes it, it, makes it soft, and it kills the bug and turns it brown. It's not going to make your pot not kosher if you cook it like that for a different halachic reason called no sin tam of gum. It's not, going to, it's not going to compromise the kosher status of your pot um, or your microwave, but it's a great way to kill the bug, turn it brown, and then you can see it quite easily. And that's what happened to me when I, a couple times I found the broccoli, I'm looking through the florets, and all of a sudden I see this 
brown line that was a worm, and that was it. Um, so it makes it more malleable, and as well, it, it changes the color of the, of the worm. That's correct. It's not going to contain. Not, it's, not, it's, not the bowl and not the rest of the bug. Not the, right. You can remove the bug. But again, once you find a bug once, I'd be a little more careful to check a little more meticulously the rest. Um, but yeah, it's not going to compromise the kosher status of anything else because the taste of the bug is not prohibited. The bug itself is prohibited, not the taste. You might not want to eat it then. But yeah. when, I, when I found it, I had a hard time eating the broccoli, but uh, that's not a halachic uh, concern necessarily. OK, so that's broccoli and cauliflower. Um, there are opinions that say you can do the water method. The star K is okay, which is the water method. You don't, even though broccoli in the States, I think is muchzak betoloim, I think it's the third category, um, but they still say just put it, you know, cut up into pieces, put it into the water, let the water go through it, agitate it, and check the water. The OU, and, and I personally rec would recommend the other method of, um, of, you know, kind of softening it up and doing a visual inspection. Um, okay, let's do, but again, you don't have to check it. Uh, we're showing that, we're demonstrating how to check vegetables, and, but broccoli and cauliflower happen to be a miyut she'en omotsu. So if you want to check, because like we said before, things change, the seasons change, the places you buy change. There's one store, I think, on Center Road that's very cheap, and it's a lower quality of produce. And when I gave this year a couple times ago, people complained, but I'm finding more often. And they all had one, there's one common denominator, they're all buying from that one place. So I check personally Kohl's, Dom's, J and J, Vic Fruit Palace, in Malvern, um, a few other. That's the, the, in the area. I'm checking from these fruit shops. But um, you know, if you're buying somewhere else, you go to a different place. You go to Perth. Things change. So it's always worthwhile, even though we're giving general principles here. But it's always recommended your particular fruit person you buy from. So check the first few times. Check broccoli the first five or six times. You find it's clean. Okay, fine. A few months later, check again a few times, just to make sure things are staying consistent. But, but if you right, right now go to a, a fruit shop somewhere in the area here and you buy broccoli, you need not check it. But is that going to last for 30 years? No. So a person has to you know, use you know, has to, common sense and, and try to keep up to date. Okay, so that's the story with broccoli. Um, cabbage. So cabbage is, is like waxy and the bugs come right off. So you put it under a stream of water and you give a, a visual inspection. Um, or you could do the same process there, but cabbage is much easier to check. Sure. So the information we have is that they're just part of the cabbage. You find them in Brussels sprouts too. They could be even a darker color there. It's like growths, kind of like where it's swollen, little swollen areas. That is not infestation. Yes, yes, it's not infestation. Okay, asparagus. Asparagus, um, in the summer months, was one of those things that were highly infested. Highly infested. The infestation takes place in the florets on top, as well as in these triangular, like leaves over here. Leaves over here. That's where the infestation <laughs> usually is. So we did not let our restaurants use asparagus. Whoever saw asparagus in the restaurants in the summer. Please call. We, we asked everyone to call us, let us know. No one should have been serving asparagus in the summer months unless they cut the top off and shave off the florets. So they all complained that what's the, the, whole, the whole aesthetic beauty of the asparagus is the top part. I'm sorry, what can we do about it? In the winter, so in the summer, asparagus comes from Australia. Kui Roop is like one of the biggest asparagus producers in the world. Um, in the winter, it comes from South America, Mexico places like that. And there, it seems not to be infested. So that's why in the winter, we've been finding much less, much less occurrence of, of infestation. The way, one way that a person can check is as follows. Take a white surface, paper towel, and gently tap the, oh, tap the uh, asparagus against. And whenever these restaurants would, 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 would complain or whatever, so I'd say, bring me the asparagus, I take this, and I go like this, and the bugs will just fall off. And they saw before their eyes, there were these black, long, skinny fellas that were coming off the asparagus. But this is a South American asparagus, and like we said, every place is different, every season is different, and this one is pa these ones are passing the test. Can make a nice little beat. 
And this is it. So, again, once it's muxak b'taloim, we're a little hesitant to, um, to, be, to permit. But if it's coming from South America, our research has shown that it's a miyuch and a matzo. So one, we'd still recommend doing the tap test. Um, soak it if you want in water, you don't have to. If you do the tap test and it, nothing falls off, it's from South America, then you can consume. That's when it comes to asparagus. Let's move on now to citrus fruits, and this I made sure that we're going to have... Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, where do artichokes fit these days? I th artichokes? Like fresh ones. I don't know. Right, so as a general principle, the looser leaves are more problematic. Brussels sprouts would be an exception to that um, because the bugs can get in, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I don't have experience with artichoke. I have to find out from the office what the, if they have any information on it. Yeah. So parsley and dill, they, they were, Rabbi Gutnick did a very big invest, thorough investigation in 2007 or 2009, around then, and he found that parsley and dill were muxak or the miyut hamatzoi, they were in categories two or three. Since then, we're almost never finding. But again, we're a little reluctant to say, don't check. So I say, do the water thing. Again, if you're finding 10, 15, 20 times you're checking, you don't see anything, you can create your own miyut in a matzoi. A person, you can have your own uncommon minority. But as a general rule, once an object gets into that category, it's hard to break it. How are we doing with time? A few minutes? Okay. Um, so let's just quickly do the citrus fruits. Yes, I'll do that right after the citrus fruit. Thank you for reminding me. I forgot about that. Okay, so here, let's pass this around. Looking for black dots on the surface that come off easily. So this, yeah, I think this one is a scale insect on top there. Pass that around. Again, the issue with the citrus fruit is not as stringent because you're not eating the peel. But you're looking for black dots. You can try to peel it off if it comes off easily. These were supposedly hand-picked that had them. Ah, yeah, this, okay, I just, I just took it off. This is another one. This here was one. It was one over there, I just took it off. Pass that around. Those are actually insects. This also. There's another one over here. These over here, those black. That's the bug. Yeah, yeah, if you peel off your finger. That was part of the fruit, maybe here. Second one, is it? These ones? Well, it's hard to tell. Let's do this test. I don't know. You have to, you have to feel around for it. If it comes off, if it comes off, then it's a bug. So it's on your hand. Just take it off your hand. You don't have to. You know, the, the fruit is still fine. But just if you're peeling the fruit, and then you're going to put your hands onto the actual fruit itself, that's where the issue arises. But what if you're eating the orange with the peel? With the peel. Like you're going to orange rind. Oh, so the, so if, if you're grating orange rind, then you have to be careful. Th then you have to inspect it beforehand. It's not so complicated. Just you know, run your finger over any black dots. If, if they come off, so, yeah. if they come off, so it's, can you consume it? Can you take it off and still use it? I don't know. I would imagine yes. I'm scared to say because I, I have to discuss it every good Nick. I would imagine if it, if it came off, it's not there. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, that is citrus fruits. Spring onions. This is a miyuch and a matsui, but we'll just show how to check just so we know. One th this is what we do. We cut off the root over here. Okay. There are two places in spring onions where you might find bugs. One is over here by this white part. What I did was I cut it in half, and I just do a visual inspection on the layers. I don't expect to find anything, and I'm not. I might go through the layers over here. It smells good. And you look for little black worms or other kind of bugs over here. The other thing you look for is, take a knife, and you cut it like that, and you're looking for those leaf miners. You're looking for any trails that might look suspicious. Again, if it's a straight line, it's probably just like, you know, it got rubbed the wrong way and the like. But um, if the leaf miners don't travel straight, they always go, not yashar, yashar. They always go in different uh, directions. So you're looking for something like that. Again, I, I've almost never found in, um, in scallions, this type of thing, leaf miners. But you have to do that with each individual piece, or yeah. you say, well, I've looked at you know, two out of ten, and it's all 
Well, again, in this country, it's a mid chain of You don't have to, you know, at, at all, you don't have to do it. But if, let's say, you want, you're concerned that this place looks, well, that they don't look as good, the quality is, is maybe is a little more poor, so then I would recommend checking every single one. If you have a massive amount, so if you have check 10%, if you check 10%, you don't find anything, so then you're okay. That's what I would say. No. It's a, it's a mid I'm saying if one wants to, but it's, this is a mid chain of You need not check leak. We do. We, we, we have something. Okay, I have to send it. You, you should have it. I have to send it. You know, okay, I have to um, maybe, maybe remember, someone can collect all your, I have an email list that I send out all infestation. I have a whole booklet I put together on infestation, the basic halachas, as well as what is, what falls into these three categories for Melbourne, and I update it every, remember, four times a year. So we can arrange, maybe, um, for all you to get on the list if you so desire. Um, yeah, Kosher Australia. Okay, so let's just do Brussels sprouts, and I think it's, we're running out of time. There's no way to save the Brussels sprout without, um, when you're checking it, there's no way to save it. You have to sacrifice it. So it's, you know, it's not so practical. Everything else you can check. If you don't find bugs, you can still use it. When it comes to Brussels sprouts, you have to cut it open like this and check. There's around five different layers of, um, of leaves, we'll call it, and you're looking for bugs. Now, I've found bugs even on the inner, inner leaves. So it's, it's not rocket science. You take each leaf off, hold it up against the light, or you just visually inspect like this. You're looking for all different types. I found worms. I found black round bugs. I found green oblong bugs, anything. You name it. So but that's what you do. You peel it apart, and you, and you inspect. So if you want to use the, you know, like this, put it into a soup or something, you can do that. But to have whole Brussels sprouts, it's a miyu tamatsui. So if you go to a place and the person doesn't know, and it's in the soup or it's in the dish, and you can't check, you can eat it. So it's the middle category, right? So if it's at the point now where it, you can't put yourself in that situation in the first place, I can't close my eyes and just chuck it into the soup. But if it's already in the soup by accident, so then you can have it. Once you can't check, it's that middle category, you don't have to check it. The, the leaves are so tightly bound together that I don't think the bugs would get out. And it's one thing if you only find infestation on the outer layers, but we found towards the middle. So therefore, there's no, there's no real way to, consume, to check it without doing what I'm doing now, which is basically ruining it. Um, that's the, uh, it's one of the few things in Australia that we have an issue with is Brussels sprouts. But um, this one actually is, seems to be okay. The question I have to ask a good which I'm curious to know, is that let's say, let's say I'll, I'll check five or six a week. Over the course, 20 weeks, 100, let's say I checked, right? Let's say I find that in total it's more than 10%, but if I look at Kohl's, Kohl's is 30%. Everything else is 6%. So can I say that Brussels sprouts and Kohl's are mid hamatsui, that middle category, but everywhere else it's not? Maybe you could. For sure, if, if you, yeah, I guess if you go to your own place where you go to buy your fruit and you check 20 weeks in a row, three Brussels sprouts a week, and you find nothing, you could probably say from your place, your local place, it's a mid hamatsui. Mid -ha so the information I'm doing from all the different shops, in a sense, is more efficient because it covers all the, ba all the places. On the other hand, maybe one shop might be a mid chain of And I'm, I'm calculating all the different stores. So things aren't so simple. But again, it's recommended everyone should conduct their own research and let me know what you find. Um, and, um, and like that, you can um, be a, an educated consumer. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, so we'll hold here. If anyone has any questions or in general, if you want to be on the email list, please send me an email. I'll somehow get to you guys my email, uh, my email address. And um, any questions? Uh, you, you said the salad, the, the salad mixes, say, like cold. Yes. Um, you don't have to wash them. It's recommended to wash them. But From a strict halakhic perspective, you don't have to wash them because right. the industrial wash is sufficient. And are all those packets, can you assume all of those packets one can buy? Yes, unless there's kale. Even if they've got like cabbage or onions or so onions might be an issue. I have to check with the office because onions and garlic yeah, might be a different story. But um, the, the four leaf. Well, that's fine. Little corn, bird's eye, the frozen stuff. Yes, yes. We walk into Coles Elstrick on the left side. All the bagged lettuce, the four leaf lettuce. All that is fine. Unless there's kale inside. That's fine. That's also fine. 
Yeah, onions, it might be different. I'm not sure about onions and garlic. That might be, it's Dev Kharif, it's called. That might be different. But um, it's all, all dedicated equipment. And, you know, yeah, so all the coleslaw, the four leaf lettuce, all these things, all these pre washed, even the frozen, the bird's eye, um, we keep an eye on the bird's eye. And um, all that is immediate she'en or matzah, it's less than 10%. Strawberries. Again, the only the basic things that are an issue are kale, asparagus, and dill. Um, but all all lettuce, all grains, leeks, celery, dates, bok choy, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, figs, spinach, dried apricots, all that is miyut she'en matzui. Send me your emails. I will send you this list over here. Um, and in category two, common minority, we have um, Brussels sprouts, blackberries, raspberries, and parsley. So one should try it. Now the industrial stuff, you're getting the frozen stuff, the raspberries and blueberries and blackberries, that you can assume is a meat and a matzah. If you're buying fresh, then what we recommend is a visual inspection. Have 10% and look for white worms. If you don't find, you're all good to go. That's by raspberries and blackberries and blueberries. Okay, those are the, that's the story. Any questions? Okay, thank you.